<clears throat> so yeah, my name is Thomas Serin, and this talk is about optimal planning and its limits. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so as we all know, we're in the middle of a climate crisis and we have to effect climate change reversal under hard physical constraints. So we have to get greenhouse gas uh, composition in the atmosphere below uh, some level X by year Y. So this is not a, a question of, of money, but of, of the real, uh, yeah, real, real physical constraints. And this is something that will require large investments and we have to use existing technologies. So we can't wait for, you know, some magical new tech to come around as the bourgeois economists think. And uh, yeah, as we can see, the market uh, <laughs> mechanism is much too slow and wasteful. And it is in fact the cause of the problem in the first place. So uh, to turn a neoliberal uh, slogan, uh, there is no alternative to planning. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so <clears throat> to give an overview of what linear planning is, I've drawn a little example economy here uh, to show that we have an interdependence between different workplaces and that each workplace can have multiple outputs and multiple inputs. And we're talking of uh, uh, concrete uh, physical goods here, not of money. So we have a, a set of tentative production levels X across several units of production and a given time horizon, which is what is the actual plan. And this time horizon could in principle be infinite if we add a, uh, a uh, eigenproduction uh, constraint uh, on the last time step. Uh, so <clears throat> we also have uh, the net outputs of the system, which is A times X uh, when linearizing around the current operating point. So this is roughly the Jacobian of the system. Uh, in addition, we have to satisfy a set of constraints uh, on these net outputs. So AX greater than or equal to B. And these A and X are derived from the structure of the economy, from demand, from stocks, from physical constraint, and of course, from, from politics. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so we can decompose uh, both A and B. Uh, so A, we can decompose into an output side and an input side. And we can also decompose B into uh, consumption, investment, trade, and uh, physical uh, constraints. So we can bake all of this into a single uh, uh, formalism. Uh, next slide. So an optimal plan then is a plan that minimizes or maximizes a linear function C on X subject to these constraints. And this forms what known, what's known as a linear program. And uh, this uh, C is politically decided uh, unavoidably basically. And it, we could choose to minimize, for example, labor time. Uh, it's something that me and Dave have suggested anyway. And uh, yeah, once we've computed this plan, we broadcast it to all units of production and as the system evolves, the plan is recomputed. Uh, so as orders are accepted, as deliveries are made, as problems arrive and so on. And this forms the feedback in the system. Uh, so this at a sort of a higher level kind of describes, uh, for example, planning in the USSR roughly. Uh, it's not quite the whole picture, but this is sort of, yeah, linear planning. Uh, next slide. So on complexity and computing this stuff. Um, solving linear programming in general and exactly is almost like, almost surely NP. However, uh, an approximate solution is fine on, yeah, and this can be computed in polynomial time. And luckily, the problem that we have is sparse. So every workplace is only connected to a small number of other workplaces. So you don't have, you know, uh, infinite input. You don't have billions of inputs into each workplace, but uh, on the order of a hundred. Uh, we can also reuse the old solution. And this is faster than solving the system from scratch. And uh, it turns out we can use something called uh, predictor corrector methods uh, to do this stuff. And it's fast enough in practice and it gives us some guarantees on convergence towards, uh, towards an optimum. And I reckon that we can do tens of billions of variables on a single machine. Uh, we can also 
make use of a cluster. And if you do so, the speed up is on the order of the square root of the number of nodes. So all of this is to say that the computational side, that's, that's the easiest bit. And that's, I, I would consider it solved. Uh, and that's not really what I'm worried about anymore, uh, have, having read the, the relevant literature. And next slide. Yes, <clears throat> however, we can make our job a little bit easier by employing a number of so-called relaxations. So instead of looking for the optimal point uh, on this diagram, it would be the rightmost extreme point. We can instead just accept whichever uh, we, we can trace in the direction of a starting point in the direction of the objective function and just pick whichever constraint we encounter first. Basically, we stop at the first <laughs> at the first constraint, and this can be computed using two uh, sparse matrix vector multiplications. So this is, you know, it's cheap to compute. Basically, uh, next slide. Uh, back. Uh, you went, yeah, thank you. Um, so another relaxation we could use is to seek to go to the center of the system. Uh, and this has some nice properties in that we stay far away from every constraint. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> we can define what's known as a barrier function that we seek to maximize. And in this case, the barrier function is the product of the distance to every constraint and this has a unique solution uh, if we do this then we can uh, uh, then we can move any constraint so let's say the leftmost constraint there the vertical constraint on, on the left let's say this corresponds to the number of pens to produce we can move that uh, a fraction of the distance towards the, the current center like a third and then recenter the system in a finite number of uh, linear system solves so that's uh, that's quite nice uh, so I've been looking a lot at this and I have you know and this is all kind of standard in the literature uh, if anyone's curious I can send them uh, papers on this uh, next slide uh, yeah thank you uh, more recently I've uh, been investigating uh, a method <coughs> revolving around inscribing the Cartesian product of multiple workplaces slash localities and uh, a locality in this uh, in this case could be for example a geographic location a municipality a workplace or even departments within the workplace and uh, this Cartesian product thing makes all of these localities orthogonal and from this orthogonality, we directly have autonomy. And this means that each locality can decide their own objective function or even none at all. And this process can be applied recursively. And I thought I'd explain a little bit how it works if I, uh, next slide. Yeah, so suppose we have two workplaces, uh, workplace one and two. And the first one has two production methods plus a linear constraint. So the linear constraint here is the the diagonal uh, line. And this could be, for example, that the number of uh, shifts are limited. So we, we can only, uh, we only have, uh, you know, uh, a, yeah, a certain number of uh, shifts per week. And the other workplace is just an interval on a single production method. Uh, next slide. So if you form the Cartesian product of these two workplaces, we get a prism. And we can see just purely geometrically, that, you know, that they're uh, orthogonal to each other, and therefore we can say that they are uh, fully autonomous. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So <clears throat> if we uh, we can then inscribe this prism in the so the larger uh, polytope here, that's the ax greater than or equal to b, and then we can inscribe uh, the prism in it. Uh, however, to do so, we have to shrink the prism slightly. But even if we do that, we still preserve this autonomy uh, property, uh, which is quite nice. So uh, it might be that, for example, on the first, well, on the second workplace, maybe the interval shrinks a little bit. Uh, 
stuff kind of like that. And I'm still uh, looking into this further, so there's more work to do algorithmically, but uh, it has some nice properties that I think uh, is worthwhile um, investigating. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so limitations and problems. So an obvious one is that uh, data isn't perfect, so we assume here that A and B are, are uh, accurate, uh, which they probably are not, there, there's some uncertainty attached. Uh, there's also question, the question of how much manual data entry we can demand of people, but of course we can try to automate the data entry, so you know we could have it so you scan the barcode on shipments as they come in and, and this makes it unnecessary for people to put that stuff in uh, by hand. And of course, statistics helps here. Mm, there is also the question of how to account for overhead and depreciation of machinery, side products and so on. And this is something that Dave has worked on, uh, Dave Zakaria, who is also in here. Um, we also have the problem that real economies are non-linear and non-convex. And non-convexity here means that we have economics of scale. So in, in linear planning, we cannot account for economics of scale. And in fact, it's pretty much the opposite. The, we, <clears throat> the marginal cost of each new product, like each new unit produced is always increasing if we are seeking optimality, which we might not always do. Uh, yeah, next slide. So a little bit more on information. Again, it's never perfect. However, in some cases, we can know the production processes quite accurately. So if we look at electronics, like a, a mobile phone, for example, that has a concrete bill of materials that tells you exactly what goes into the phone. Every screw, every chip, uh, you know, the, the exact circuit board that has to be manufactured and so on. And similarly with chemical processes, these are often quite well um, characterized. So those are kind of the easy cases. Uh, however, some production is one-off and this could be like a repair shop. Uh, we have in Umeå for example an audio repair guy and he gets different things every week. Uh, and some other production is hard to predict. So the typical example is farming because the weather is hard to predict. And of course people can enter uh, incorrect data either accidentally or on purpose. So this has to be dealt with in various ways. And finally, labor is always uncertain. So it might take on average, we find statistically that a phone takes 15 minutes to assemble, but that's no guarantee. So there, there's, even when we know uh, the bill of materials, that doesn't mean that the labor is known. Next slide. So <clears throat> we have some potential, uh, wait, forward again. You changed slide to, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so we identify symmetric access to information as uh, an important property. And if we have this, then people can inspect each other's numbers. And if they can do this, we expect something like Wikimagic to occur. So like a, a comedy of the commons effect. Uh, we also say that this is essential to democracy, because if you have asymmetric access to information, then you have data bunkers, and when you have data bunkers, you get tiny popes, uh, which we don't want. We can also have automatic checks, um, or what's known as gates in Soviet parlance, and these are just you know automatic sanity checks on data input, like look for an extra zero being put in, and stuff like that. Uh, there, it can also be the case that workplaces try to overstate uh, their inputs, as we see in the Soviet Union, for example. However, if they do this and there's more than one workplace in a given industry, it's likely that they will see their allocations decrease. And this can be interpreted as the solver routing around inefficient workplaces. Next slide. Yeah, so there are, of course, various other concerns. Here be dragons. Um, so some workplaces have no outputs at all, but they do affect B. So they affect the right-hand right side of the system. And this could be schools or hospitals and so on, who, which basically only demand inputs. They have no 
corresponding entry in X. You can't like turn a dial and tell a hospital to cure more people or whatever, or make more people sick. That's not really how it works. <clears throat> and as Max uh, was touching on, estimating consumer demand is very important. And here we can, of course, use uh, statistics to try and predict things, but we can also encourage people to pre-order stuff. Uh, I would expect, like, expe espe especially expensive things like a car or whatever. Just, you know, put in a pre-order, maybe get a lower price, yada yada. Um, we also have the question of remuneration, which is how, uh, how people get paid and what, like, what means of payment do we have, what to be demand payment for, and so on. And here there are a lot of ideas. We could have labor vouchers, we could have ration books, we could have an auctioning system and so on. Uh, we could also give some goods and services for free, like healthcare, for example. And finally, how do workers interact with the system? Can they say no? Mm, and this is why we say that democracy is very important. Like if people, people need to be able to get their hands on the system and when they can do this we expect the data quality to become better uh, yeah next slide uh, so what is to be done uh, well we have to develop formalisms and theory which is happening but there needs to be more of it we need to develop software so we have uh, as has already been mentioned by uh, uh, Leon, we have uh, Dave and his uh, Dave and his student Luke Hagberg have been developing a thing called receiving horizon planning, which is up on GitHub. We also need to popularize and disseminate these ideas, which we are we're having this thing discussion. And uh, finally, we need uh, pilot projects to basically to see what works and what doesn't. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, one thing that struck me as well this morning, we need to study the history of planning, which is very poorly, like planning in the Soviet Union is not very well documented. And this is something that has to be uh, dug into and I've been doing this more recently. Yeah, that's what I had to say. Uh, next slide. I mean, if I don't know if we, do, we can do questions later, I guess, but. Yeah, that's what I had to say. <laughs>